There we are. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to History Matters. And so does Coffee. And thank you, Kara Lee, our 206th episode. I will never stop being excited by the fact that we've done that many. But um, today I am surprisingly, not surprisingly, going to talk a little bit about the State of the Union Address, a little bit about State of the Union Addresses generally. But before I do any of that, I turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who is at the NCHE conference. There needs to be a t-shirt that's like, where in the world is Annie Evans? <laughs> and and she's, she's beaming in from Cleveland. Yes. So good morning, everybody. I am here in Cleveland. I'm with Carolee and Cece, John, Jessica, Claire. Um, we are excited to be here. We had great tours yesterday. I think they were like 10 or 11 options. Um, we have sessions today and tomorrow. So um, if you are tuning in, but you are also here in Cleveland, please let us know. Come find us. Um, but this morning, no matter what, as you guys know, no matter where we're traveling or what we're doing, we always find a way to log into History Matters. So if you're new, if this is your first time, you picked a really good time to join us because we're in the middle of the conference. Um, <laughs> so introduce yourself in the chat if that's the case. But the way this works is Joanne's going to talk about today's topic for about 30 minutes. You are free to chat away. But if you have questions about today's topic, we'd love it for you to put that down below in the q and I'll be back in about 30 minutes and then we will look at your questions. See you in a little bit. Excellent. And uh, as Annie just said, um, if you're here for the first time, please do post in chat that you were here for the first time to everyone. Um, because we have a real community here, given 206 episodes, and they will give you a robust welcome. And I gather it it appears to me maybe that some people are playing bingo, uh, and you can turn to chat for that, um, because there are certain things I say every week. Uh, I, I'm not going to say them right now, because then everyone will get bingo. But at any rate, okay, let's turn to the topic at hand, the State of the Union Address. Now, I couldn't help thinking, um, and maybe I think this any time uh, in the recent past, when there's some kind of a presidential address of any kind, I couldn't help thinking of Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina in 2009, who, uh, when President Obama was giving a speech to a joint session, so it wasn't a State of the Union address, uh, and he called out, I'm sure most of you here remember it, you lie! And everyone noticed, and Nancy Pelosi apparently behind Obama looked shocked, and it was a moment, like, gosh! Uh, and Wilson ended up apologizing. He called the White House to apologize. He issued a statement. He was reprimanded by Congress. He issued a statement. This is a statement he issued. This evening, I let my emotions get the best of me when listening to the president's remarks regarding the coverage of illegal immigrants and the health care bill. While I disagree with the president's statement, my comments were inappropriate and regrettable. I extend sincere apologies to the president for this lack of civility. That was then, <laughs> 2009, man, that's like another planet. Um, we're in a different place uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the place we're in and some of what we saw. Uh, and to me, even more interesting, who was the president speaking to and what was his main message? Um, but I do wanna start off as the historian in me would, um, just giving you a quick version of why we have a State of the Union Address, and it's in the Constitution. Um, it's Article 2, Section 3, and it says, I'm going to quote the Constitution, that the President shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as, as he shall judge necessary and expedient. Okay, what's interesting about that, or one of the interesting things about that is what it says is that the president shall give information to Congress and make recommendations. So initially, this was supposed to be the executive branch and the legislative branch meeting. And it's why, you know, the, the president is invited into the chamber because the executive branch isn't superior to the legislative branch. And it wasn't called the State of the Union Address throughout all of American history. It started out being called the President's Annual Message to Congress, because that's what it was, right? The president talking to Congress 
part of the reason it was largely aimed at Congress, I mean, that was its purpose, the executive informing the legislative branch. Of course, also technology changed the nature of what the address could be, radio, TV, everything else. And now, you know, <laughs> social media, um, obviously suddenly what was primarily at least an address to Congress became in the 20th century, really, an address to the nation, a, a forum, a public forum for a president to speak to the nation. Uh, and, you know, if you think about, and this is what I want to come back to in a moment, you think about who presidents are speaking to when they speak during the State of the Union address, that varies. And I think we saw a few variations on that last night. Um, okay, so let's briefly touch on some of what we saw last night, because as I, um, I don't know, tooted, posted, threaded, I don't know where I put it. Um, one of the things I suggested yesterday uh, when I was thinking ahead to this morning uh, is that in some ways when you look at a State of the Union address, and I'm not so much talking about the words as I am the entire experience, it's kind of a mirror of where we are, which is why we're nowhere near someone saying you lie and then apologizing. But, um, you know, I, and I, I am a fan of um, like protocol in a sense of performative acting out. And by that, I mean the whole rigmarole of, you know, the president of the United States comes into the room and, the, you know, the handshaking and we get the Supreme Court justices and we get Congress and we get the cabinet and we get the vice president. And, you know, it's like, it's regardless of where we actually stand right now in our political situation, and that's a big <laughs> regardless, you do see on the most superficial level, the acting out of democratic governance in all of this happening uh, as it always happens in a representative chamber of government. And I, I like the, at least the ideal behind it. I like seeing it. And, you know, again, given technology, we can see it. And I said to people yesterday, like, it, it, even if you don't watch the address, just watch this because it is acting out a certain vision of what the United States is, was, or could be, take your pick. Now, um, we saw a few things looking around that chamber, waiting for the president to come. There was a whole block of women, members of Congress in white, uh, who were there representing reproductive freedom, dressed in white as suffragettes, used to dress in white. I didn't see it, but apparently there were people in kafia uh, scarves. Uh, I didn't see that. It was probably harder to see than the, the block of white. Um, but again, people making a very strong statement about Gaza. Um, there was Marjorie Taylor Smith uh, wearing her MAGA hat, and there was a lot of murmuring about that, at least uh, on TV, because you're not supposed to wear a hat within the House or Senate, and that's a big deal, but okay, there you go. Um, so you could see some things, you know, and you could see, um, Mar I'm sorry, Marjorie Taylor Greene, did I say Smith? Uh, my apologies. Um, you could see a, a sea of blue blazers uh, off to the left. It was really quite remarkable. So, you know, you got a sort of an image of things. Now, Thinking generally, um, State of the Union addresses can do a variety of things, right? And, and here's just a list of things they have done in the past, they could do. Um, sometimes they can really be just mostly informative. And this is probably particularly true, true during a crisis, maybe, when there are important things to be said that have a lot to do with the current moment. So State of the Union addresses can be mostly informative. They can be campaign-y. They can be, you know, sort of almost campaign rally-like. They can be vision-ish, right? Just proposing a vision, a president's vision for what the nation could or should be. Um, they can be, um, what I've written down here in my notes is President Posey. <laughs> and by that, I mean a president performing as president and, and offering that image in a State of the Union address. In a way, we saw bits of that a lot of those things in last night's State of the Union address. The president did say what I believe presidents always say, I think since Ronald Reagan, the state of our union is strong, right? That's, you gotta say it, he said it. 
Um, and so there you had it. Uh, and that was a sub message, I think, of what he said uh, yesterday throughout the address. Um, we saw, you know, him as a practiced politician, particularly not up when he was speaking, but, you know, the time he spent on the floor, shaking hands and talking to people. And, and you can see that he likes that, that energizes him. You really see a, an experienced practiced politician. So in a sense, that's a, he wasn't just posing, but there you're seeing the presidency be performed. Um, but I think, and this will be interesting to talk about um, once I'm done with my comments here. To me, one of the major, if not the main messages of the comments last night was fighting back. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. Um, sometimes he was fighting against my predecessor, right? He never said Donald Trump's name. Uh, I believe I read somewhere this morning that he said my predecessor 13 times. Uh, I did not count. Um, but he made it clear that he was pushing back against my predecessor, who is now my opponent. Um, he clearly was fighting the simple fact that the press has been endlessly saying that he's too old. He's a doddering old man. So in his manner, in, you know, he, he was like almost shouting. He was fiery. He was aggressive. I'm going to come back to responding to hecklers in a moment, but you know, he was clearly performing a, I'm not a doddering old man, uh, and did it and did that well, I would say. But so he was fighting back against that never ending statement by the press and by some Republicans that he's too old to be president. Um, for a very brief moment, he was fighting the Supreme Court and not really fighting, but he pushed back against the court, which was very interesting. Um, and here's, um, well, apparently this was off script. So he was going to talk about, obviously, what the Supreme Court had done, particularly regarding abortion rights. Um, and I don't have the precise phrase, but his what he was going to say in his speech formally, which, of course, people get given, was something about, you know, women have power and the court knows that. And it was it was a kind of basic statement. But. Biden went off script and apparently said, when he said, with all due respect, justices, looking at them, women are not without electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much. That was ad-libbed, which is interesting, right? That, that he, in that moment, not only gave those words, but he addressed the justices, which is not something that happens that often during a State of the Union address. I thought that was really interesting. He also, if we're talking about fighting and the kind of, you know, fighting back that he was doing, obviously he was fighting back against, in a very immediate sense on the floor, some Republicans, right? And, you know, heckling doesn't work well against him. And I think this is the practiced politician in him. He is very good at twisting the heckling around and spinning it back on the person who tossed it, right? And I've talked... At, on a previous episode of History Matters about pushback politics, that a really effective way of pushing back is with humor, uh, with a kind of lighthearted comment, because at the same time you're pushing back, you're also kind of belittling the force with which someone threw something at you. So you deflate the pomposity and force of the person who's trying to make a point. You're like, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> it's hard it's hard to not deflate a little if that's the response that's not the response you want when you are really throwing out comments like that um in the case of marjorie taylor green uh first of all again the hat um she also had a shirt on that said say her name and she was wearing a pin with a photograph of uh, i think lakin Riley is how you pronounce her name, who was a 22-year-old nursing student who was killed by someone that federal authorities say had entered the country illegally. Now, he had been expected to say in his speech, I will not demonize immigrants saying they poisoned the blood of our country. Uh, and he clearly was referring to the former president. Um, but then, because Marjorie Taylor Greene yelled at him, he said, he responded to her again, off script, 
an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. And I have to say, I winced. Um, an illegal is like beyond dehumanizing. Um, and that was an ad lib comment, which is why that came out of his mouth. His, people who were helping prepare comments would not have put that in his mouth. Um, and it was an interesting moment uh, because, you know, I, I think like everyone, I in watching it, there were things I supported. There were things I thought, OK, there were things I wasn't sure about. And that was the thing where I just was like, oh, that was that's not good. Like, I don't like what that suggests. Um, but then he quickly added, there are thousands of other murders who um, he attributed to legals, legals, meaning people who legally reside in the United States. So he said that, and then he kind of tried to tap dance it back a little bit. But again, ad-libbed comments, in that case, it's in response to Marjorie Taylor Greene yelling. And I think, you know, again, practice politician, he's good at that. But in one way or another, he's really pushing back against a lot of things. And I think that's a lot of what we saw last night. You know, in a sense, the the lowest bar for him, even though it's not a low bar, is that he had to perform in a strong manner to push back against the endless talking about his age. Endless, right? So in some way, this was a chance to stand up and say, please stop. <laughs> like, come on you know he spoke for over an hour I think he spoke for 68 minutes so that was like the the minimum that he had to do but I think his his manner and um his message as I said at the outset I think he was primarily fighting back or pushing back um and so in that sense um it was also something of a campaign speech right it it it's a speech he could have made, I suppose, at a rally with some variations. Um, so it's interesting to consider, you know, when you watch a State of the Union address, the obvi it's obvious and seems pointless to ask, who is this person speaking to? But watching the speech last night, you could ask yourself, okay, is he speaking to the room? Well, sometimes he was. Is he speaking to us? Yeah, a lot of the time. So is is it an you know addressed to the nation and was he showing the nation how he thinks or deals with Congress? I mean, it's very interesting to consider what he performed specifically yesterday, um, in addition to the words that he used. The manner and the performance always matter, and in this case, at this moment, when we're talking generally speaking about fundamentals about the office of the presidency and what a president is and what a president does and what a president should be like on the most basic small d democratic level the performance of a president matters it matters in in all kinds of ways so the the the, the degree to which we could watch him perform as president we're at a moment where that has interesting levels of meaning that aren't necessarily always the case. I think when um, democracy itself in one way or another is on the ballot, um, then watching a president perform before a legislative chamber and before the nation becomes even more meaningful. Um, I'm a couple minutes early, but I think, I think I'm gonna stop there because I actually, I'm really interested to see what people thought about the address in our conversation today that we'll start in a moment or two um, and to have time for questions. Um, what I love about these kinds of moments is because it's undeniably, obviously, political. It's undeniably significant that it's happening. It, it, undeniably, there is a broad audience. So there aren't that many moments in American culture where everybody, or at least a lot of people tune in to one thing, you know, it used to be in the ancient days uh, before you had cable and streaming, if a, an important show came on, then you kind of thought, well, everybody's watching it now. And there would be jokes about how um, when commercials came, like everyone in the world got up to flush the toilet, go to the bathroom, and then like water levels would go down. You know, in the old days, we all sat and watched things together. And then there would be water cooler conversations the next day. And I remember doing that for Roots. I remember watching Roots and everybody was watching Roots and you knew everybody was watching Roots. Well, we don't have a lot of moments like that, sort of common culture moments. And this was a common culture political moment that we shared. Uh, and I think that actually matters too. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move my notes out of the way. 
Um, okay, so for, oops, open this so I can see you guys better. So for those of you who, um, I, I, mug, 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 for those of you who are new here, um, that every week for 206 weeks, um, I have a mug that in one way or another reflects the conversation. And as I say every week, I don't have 206 mugs. And this one I've used before, and I was almost going to get irritated at the outset because someone guessed it. <laughs> and let me explain what this mug is. It says Pomp and Crest for the Door, um, 89, 1789. Uh, and what it represents is we were talking about, I think, women in politics. And there was this joke in 1789. Oh, my gosh. Women are becoming so involved in politics that there's a woman running to be the doorkeeper. And the... Um, fake name they gave up to this woman who claimed she could do it because she's tall because her hair was very big was Roxana Wilhelmina Pompencrest. <laughs> and so Matt Messias, who is my former partner in crime, um, I don't remember, did Caroline make the mug in response to Matt? I forget this every time I use did this. Did Matt make it? I can't remember. I can't remember. Caroline didn't. Matt didn't. Someone did. Um, and I. someone else did. At any rate, this was obviously made for us. Um, and this, how could this not be appropriate? It's the door, it's the chamber. Um, so this morning when I went into the kitchen and I was like, uh-oh, state of the union, state of the, oh, Freeman. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so obvious, but okay, I will stop and I will, um, we can open things up. Yes. All right. We've got some good questions this morning. I am going to start off with Francesca who we hope is feeling better. She had a little spill and had a little ankle twist going on. We hope you're feeling better. She asked if you have any comments about the kitchen sink rebuttal. Oh yeah, um, that's a good point. And uh, I certainly could have mentioned that. Um, wow, talk about visual imagery. So let's not even talk about the words. Let's just talk about what popped up on our screen for the rebuttal. Your eyes just opened really big, Annie. Yeah. So. We're, we're watching a legislative chamber, you know, we're watching the house, we're watching the Capitol, we're watching the performance of government and everything that I just talked about, protocol and everything else. And then we segue to a woman in a kitchen. I mean, the symbolism of that, I don't even have to state, but the the jarring impact of that, you know, I I have to say, you know, as a woman uh, who studies politics, I felt insulted. Like really, like a woman in the kitchen, like really? And I, I get that it was like, you know, women have important things to do and the, you know, subliminal idea that, you know, a woman in the kitchen is good old fashioned America. And uh, she was wearing a big cross. Someone pointed out to me, it was a diamond encrusted or bejeweled cross right so it was a cross but it was a like cross but but i'm one of you uh to the you know sort of wealthy at any rate the visual imagery of that and the way in which it communicated so powerfully a message about america this is a real america it's about mothers and children it's about kitchens and christianity and i'm not saying that any of those things are bad they're not but to present that to the nation as the main message of your party, that's a really strong statement. And by doing it in the manner that she did, the sort of whispery, earnest tone that didn't sound earnest, the entire thing, like if, if I were teaching a course about like political rhetoric or political performance, man, I would love to have that in front of me because what that what they were deliberately trying to communicate number one what they actually were communicating number two and and what that says about where the republican party is now it was it was quite quite striking i mean and you know i think the rebuttal address is always problematic you know there's always weird things that happen the drinking too much water and you know all the weird moments it's, it's a hard position to be in but the message of that, I would love to know more about the conversation that led to that, because um, that was that was powerful. And particularly in contrast with the image of 
government in action and in a room which largely was men and then we'll see a woman in the kitchen that that wow um so yeah i'll 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 stop there but um that was quite quite something to see i have to say um i i think i literally was taken aback in my chair when that started maybe that was part of the point um so Deb Pomerantz, who's with us quite frequently, she was wondering why was the State of the Union so late this year? And I do feel like it used to always kind of be in late January, early February, and now we're into March. So was there some sort of strategic reason, do you think, behind that? I mean, you're right. I think it tends to be often in January, as far as I understand it. Um, President Biden asked for it to be in March, and it was. I don't know. If there was, there obviously must have been some reasoning behind it. I don't know. Hmm. Um, maybe he was, I don't know. I mean, I'm making it up. Maybe he's pushing it at least a little closer to the election. I have no idea. Hmm. Um, but at any rate, you're right. It, it normally is earlier than this. This is pretty late. All right. Um, Tom Pinellas, another frequent flyer with us here at History Matters, uh, asks, would you care to elaborate on your tweet from last night about Katie Britt in the kitchen? I'm sorry, repeat that. He wanted to know if you could elaborate more on your tweet from last night about Katie Britt in the kitchen. Oh, well, that was what I was just, yeah. in a sense, talking about. And my, I think my <laughs> my tweet, um, my tweet w was saying something along the, and I, and I did not say it in the most graceful way possible, but what I was basically saying was, oh, it's a woman in a kitchen wearing a cross talking about her children. Um, and that's a really strong statement. And I think I said something like, um, when you're voting Republican, look what you're, be sure you know what you're voting for. And I didn't mean that to be like, boo, mother's children and Christianity and kitchens. Like that wasn't my, the message I intended. I was just saying, this is who they want to appeal to. This is who they want to be. And you just need to know, think about what it is you're voting for. I'm not even saying you shouldn't vote for it. But that was a really powerful political message and the subliminal text about where women should be and what they should be doing, I found that eerie. Uh, and the fact that religion was brought into it, um, I also found that not cheering, given the moment that we're in. So yeah, I didn't, uh, I certainly in that uh, comment didn't mean to say like, boo, all of those things. I was saying, well, that's a really strong message about where people want certain people to be. So, you know, be aware of it. If you like that, go for it, vote, but don't pretend they're not saying what they're saying. Yeah, um, someone named Carlson, uh, who I think might be new, I don't recognize Carlson as being with us before. Um, Carlson, you're only tweeting to the host. I don't know if you meant to change it to everyone, but um, Carlson brought the point that it's actually the speaker who sets the date and invites the president to give the remarks. So it must have been Mike Johnson. And maybe the reason they didn't have it earlier is because they were fighting and they couldn't elect a speaker for a while. So it could be. Related, I right? thought I read somewhere earlier that there had been some discussion. But no, the the the, the point made there is true, uh, that it's the speaker who decides and issues the invitation. I thought I had read earlier today that there had been some discussion of date. But you're right. It could be that there wasn't. I can't remember where I read that. The speaker, so they couldn't like it. I was going to say, you know, any number of reasons that Congress was buzzing around oh. not doing the things it normally does so i i don't know yeah all right um tim our good friend tim johnson asked what did you make of the breach of protocol when the president did not allow the speaker to introduce him to congress but instead just launched straight into his speech i know that was interesting so i actually initially didn't catch that um but then i saw other people commenting like you know, there's where was the introduction? And um, I read different accounts of that this morning. There were some people saying, you know, he was so roaring to go that he got up and he just went uh, and he just spoke over Mike Johnson. Um, so that would suggest, you know, in a sense, it wasn't intentional. He just sort of charged in. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was not the way this normally proceeds. And that's part of the protocol that I usually enjoy so much, which is that the speaker introduces the president. That goes back to what I said earlier about part of what this demonstration suggests is that the president is only there at the invitation of the speaker and of Congress. But um, I don't know the whether that was energy or whether that was deliberate. M my impulse would be to say it was like 
I'm in, but you know, charging ahead, but I don't know. Don't know yet. Um, what whether there was logic there or whether it was just it just happened. All right. Um Dave, who's with us quite a bit, um, we always love hearing from Dave. Dave asks, why did teachers, especially K K-12, do to teach decorum in classrooms, city council meetings, and Congress? Oh, but what do they do? Yeah, what do they do to teach decorum? I guess because we're having, we're leading, we're seeing so many bad examples. And I put something in the chat earlier, Joanne, I don't know if you saw it. Um, someone from Georgia was saying in the chat that they were embarrassed to have a representative who behaved the way that their particular one did last night. And I just was telling her that we work with a lot of Georgia teachers. We've been to Georgia several times in the work that we do. And that there's some Georgia teachers here who were, we were actually talking about that yesterday here at the conference. Interesting. Um, and I just said in the chat, I want everyone to know that there are many, many fine teachers in Georgia who are working very hard to explain to kids, this is not a normal cycle. This is not how things normally go. This is not the best way to, you know, treat your colleagues and, and show respect for our elected officials in our country. So um, I so would say- they're having really, you know, they're having to sort of teach around like these, these are not the examples we would want for you to live up to when you become the future leaders of our country. Well, so that's what I was about to say. So it becomes a teaching moment. Yeah, you have to. That's all you can do in that kind of, <laughs> I mean, there's the last six years have been a lot of teachable moments. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's a good strategy. So, yeah. I mean, there's really nothing else you can do in that case. So... Didn't mean to answer that one for you, but I guess- No, no, I was about to actually ask you to answer it. So, <laughs> so that was perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, Kevin Brady asked, do you think State of the Union overshadowed the Gaza protests that were going on in DC? Um, well, I mean, I think the State of the Union sort of overshadows a lot. Um, I think that the fact that there were people wearing scarves in the room, I wish I had seen that, uh, totally valid and a good way to remind people about what was happening. Um, I think there were people holding up, members of Congress holding up signs that said something like limited ceasefire now or something like that. Um, and all of that, you know, that's valid. That's that's a way to protest without interrupting the president or, you know, howling or screaming or um, whatever it is that you want to do to get attention. So it's not just the president who sees you, but the nation and your constituents who see you. Um, it, it overshadowed a lot of things. Sure. I mean, it's supposed to, right? It's, it's, it's an address to the nation, but um, I think it's valid. You know, normally you see that with like, and we talked about this during the last state of the union, right? Pins. People wear pins that make statements. And and I think, was it a last year's State of the Union that some Republicans were wearing guns, little gun pins, I yeah. think. Uh, and we wanted to make a, like books, a book pin to fight back against the gun pins. Anyway, um, you know, I think, I think those are all valid ways to protest, to make a statement. Um, so I, I don't think that was bad. And it probably did um, override what was going on outside because it was supposed to, be, you know, I mean, as I said, it's it's a once a year thing, State of the Union address. It's going to overshadow a lot of things. Yeah. All right. Um, Bobby, our good friend Bobby asks, says, as a teacher, I need certain requirements like a college degree, a master's within five years, certain extra credit hours to keep you know my teaching license up to date. Why aren't there any requirements for people who run for Congress? Why aren't there any? any special requirements like you have to know about the constitution you have to have some level of understanding how a bill becomes a law you know it just well, seems like you have, have to go oath. through a lot of hoops to have that job how come congress members no, of congress that's true. you have to take an oath um i really you know there have been times generally speaking well there was a, actually there was a, a an argument at one point um maybe when trump was president um, there was like this big assertion, uh, we're going to read the constitution at the beginning of the session, right? <laughs> and then people revealed that that's actually been done before. It's not a, like a new thing. Um, yeah. Should, should it be the case that if you're in Congress, you've read the constitution, you know, how a bill becomes a law. Um, it should, uh, 
but you know, should we give members of Congress a test that they have to pass? I don't know about that. Um, the answer is yes, people should have certain basic skills. It's also true that as a representative body, and this has always been true, there have always been people in Congress who pretty wide range of people in Congress who have different skills and often those skills have absolutely nothing to do with the actual political process. You know, um, what was the guy, a, a, an iron oven maker or something in the period that I write about. There are people with all kinds of professions found their way into Congress and they were elected and thus they were being representative of the people who put them there. But yeah, the idea that everyone there um, should know some basic things, a lot of them sure do, but should everybody? Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, Susan brought up a good point in the chat. She said she just talked about this with her government class and that she said it's it just that most people won't get elected if they don't have some kind of credentials. And then the reply was, well, the former resident at the White House didn't appear to have any credentials so we'll see it, it um, depends on how you define credentials yeah really depends on how you know credentials can mean um i'm a total outsider who doesn't know all this fancy stuff and you know that's that's always um a popular message you know i'm on the outside i'm gonna drain the swamp whatever the you know, version of that has been throughout american history that's a kind of credential i suppose depending on what you're looking for all right, uh, Dale, our good friend Dale from Williamsburg asks, given the idea of old has changed over the years, were there other presidents who during their time period, they were considered too old for the job? Uh, well, that's interesting. I, I mean, my hunch would be uh, yes. And my hunch would also be uh, it would have been hard to make that as much of an issue as we're seeing right now, just given technology and how easy it is to spread that. I mean, there have been all kinds of um, reasons why people pointed to candidates and say they couldn't be president. Um, you know, go all the way back. Thomas Jefferson has had no military duty. He's not fit to be a leader. He's never been in the military. That's bad. Um, John Quincy Adams, you know, yeah, well, th that versus um, Andrew Jackson, you know, vote for the man who can fight, not the man who can write. Um, there have been all kinds of reasons why people have said someone is or isn't capable of being president. Um, again, I right now off the top of my head, I can't think of it a, an example. Maybe someone will come up with one where, where it was like explicitly like he's too old, but that wouldn't surprise me if it's happened before, because again, that's that's campaigny rather than necessarily realistic, right? It's, it's something you can debate. It's a point worth talking about on one side. On the other side, if you're looking for ways to oppose somebody, that's a thing you can say, right? So both of those things, um, I think, are in play. Yeah, and, and that's Deb true, actually, I'm sorry, Deb just said um, lifespans used to be yeah, shorter. I was gonna comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old, old is is also- Old is relative term, depending on the time frame. <laughs> true. Oh, there right. you go. Reagan, of course. Yep. Of course. Had Reagan in there. Yep. Yeah. All right. Troy asks, should we as a group of attuned citizens be concerned more of our fellow country people seem to get taken in by the nonsensical age issue and their apparent inability to understand all the things Biden has accomplished that's on the line per Ukraine, reproductive rights, putting people in camps, et cetera. And He's wondering, like, why are so many of our fellow country people lacking dedication and attention to democracy? Well, you know, um, this partly touches on something that we've talked about before, which is um, when the framers and the founders uh, were deliberating over what it was they were creating, um, some of them, and particularly people who ended up being federalists, um, but generally, even before there were federalists, the idea of a demagogue was seen as extremely threatening. Why? Because the people, the American people, would be bedazzled or pulled in emotionally or whatever by someone who just wanted power and they could say or do whatever, or perform whatever, or you know, play on people's emotions in some way and people would get swept away with it and then that person would get power and then once in power, that person would do scary things. So um, that's been a long-term, you know, idea uh, that that's a that's a weakness of democracy, uh, and and you know there is truth 
to that. You know, we have a government in which public opinion rules, public opinion. We, the people, give power and supposedly are able to take power away when people lose elections. Um, but still, um, that that is a strength and a, and a vulnerability. Remind me, Andy, because I feel like I didn't answer part of the question. He was wondering about the, the age issue keeping overshadowing all the actual accomplishments of the- uh, uh, Okay, because yeah, I did want to talk about that too. Um, so some of that, I saw some of that being addressed in the, well, on social media, not in the press. What people on social media were saying was um, complaining that, you know, the president needs to be louder about his accomplishments in the press when the press should actually be talking about the accomplishments. You know, it was, it was people being irritated that the press are actually sort of saying, why don't you talk about your comp? your accomplishments, President Biden, and then the press isn't talking about the accomplishments. It's an interesting kind of morass that we're in, right, in which the president has accomplished a lot. And we don't know what it is he's accomplished to a remarkable degree. And the press doesn't really cover that stuff. And particularly now when age is everywhere all the time, um, it, you know, you could also, I suppose, attach it to the fact that um, it's way more interesting for people to see things that are bad or wrong or horse races than it is to get like reports on things that have or haven't been accomplished. Um, so some of this might be what we've, what in general, we've now come to accept as to what the press does or doesn't do. That's a different conversation. We've had different versions of it before. I almost picked it for today because of something I read uh, which I won't go into because then it'll veer me off topic. Um, but yeah, I I think we should be reading more about it. It would not get as much readers as horse race coverage or, oh my gosh, he's too old. So while I think those things are worth reporting and I think discussing, if you want to talk about the president's age, go right ahead. But But hammering at that and somehow not hammering at the fact that his opponent is like two, three years younger and and has significant problems of his own. That 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 just feels to me like creating trouble and rather than giving us useful information. It could be addressed differently. You could say, like, does it matter? Does his age matter? I don't know. Let's talk. But that's not that's does not feel to me what the press generally says. All right. Tom asks, was Biden doing something akin to northern members of Congress in the 1850s, finally starting pushing back on the bullying they were getting from southerners? That is, that is, yes. <laughs> and the reason I'm so happy about that is because, yes, um, that is something I've talked about before here, and I, and I called it pushback politics. Uh, and I talked about how uh, at a certain point, uh, Northern, so so for those who don't know my work or anything else, the book lurking over my shoulder is about physical violence in the U.S. Congress and which Southerners um, intimidated Northerners in a variety of ways to get them to be silent or compliant and particularly when it came to the issue of slavery. And then eventually in the 1850s and particularly the late 1850s, different kinds of people from the North came to Congress, the Republican Party as it existed in that moment, came to Congress um, and they were pushing back. They weren't the first two, but they were pushing back basically. They're like, this is a different, we're a different kind of Northerner. We're gonna push back. Now, before that, I've talked before about like Joshua Giddings of Ohio um, who would, you know, I call him an um, abolitionist Toreador because he would deliberately say something that he knew would get a Southerner upset and probably get him to charge at him physically. And then, you know, Giddings could say, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the barbaric South. Um, so there are many different ways in which you can push back. I think when I talked about it here previously, um, I was talking about humor as being particularly useful to push back. And I was, and I always gave examples, current examples um, of people using humor effectively, bringing props or something in to come back against someone thinking, aha, I got him. Here's the comment. It's going to rip him to shreds. And the person coming back and saying, <laughs> yeah, really? Let's talk about this. So I think pushback politics can be really effective. It certainly, you know, altered the dynamic 
of what was happening in national politics uh, and is partly what gave rise to the original Republican Party is that they were seen as fighters, not necessarily in a physical sense, although some of them declared themselves that, but in a sense that, you know, we're going to fight the slave power. And that was one of their main messages. We're going to push back. We're a new kind of northerner, they said again and again. And, and that's what they meant. All right. Kevin has asked, the direct speaking to the SCOTUS was reminiscent of Obama glaring at Justice Roberts after the Citizens United ruling. Have there ever been physical fights during the State of the Union? He's Did they ever break out into a brawl? I don't think so. Um, and I, I don't think so, partly because um, there was a chunk of time where um, State of the Union addresses didn't happen with someone going to Congress, the president going there and delivering them. I don't think there's been a State of the Union. There, there were many other brawls, but I don't think I remember finding a State of the Union brawl. That's a really good question. I didn't look specifically for that. Most of the, the fighting and threatening um, really was during debate more than anything else. And it was sometimes a way to steer debate or sometimes a way to shut somebody up. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a really good question. I, I don't, I didn't notice it. I have these big binders, you know, binders of women. I have binders of fights. Uh, I can show you what it looks like uh, during the, the after party. Um, <laughs> I, know, I do, two huge binders of fights. Um, and I don't remember seeing um, anything like that, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I think Fight Finders is a new band name. Claire, please write that down the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like um, Carol Lee. I have binders of fights. As no, one <laughs> binders, plural even. Okay. Oh, yeah. Francesca asked, could the speaker have declined to invite Biden to give a State of the Union? Well, now that was debated. That has, even in like, not that long ago, I remember that being debated. Like, can they refuse? I think maybe that was Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump. Maybe that was like, can can she not invite him or something like that? Um, I don't think that's happened again. I did not go and study through all of time, all State of the Union addresses, but um, it feels to me as though there's so much vulnerability that that would introduce about fear and opposition and democracy that that might not be a really effective ploy to adopt. So I wouldn't think it would be very smart. Of course, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Um, but I think there's talk about it, there's threats of it, but I'm not aware that that's actually happened. All right. Um, and that's right. Um, Kevin Brady said, someone wanted to not invite Biden. Someone talked about it, it's true. But again, I think there's always talk in one way or another, but yeah. All right. Um, J.L. Lund asks, please comment on the calls by some Republicans that the speaker should refuse. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. That's the same thing that was similar question. So we'll just skip that one. It was the same as the last one. Okay. Um, understanding that there are no basic skills for Congress critters, as Bobby calls them in this question. <laughs> Congress critters might be a band name. Uh, do, we, do we not value democracy? Who would go to a doctor without knowing that they had a medical license? I am even asked my roof contractor to show me their contractor's license. So she's wondering about this no basic skills for con Congress piece. Well, you know, it, it in in some way, it it is a, what, how do I want to put this? It would be very possible to believe that you don't need to know anything other than like what I think and what my constituents think. And that's all that you have to do. I mean, I think people, some people have a sense that there's like a dark, scary, swampy background where things happen, but the process of politics and understanding the process and being able to use the process and knowing how to engage in it and knowing how to get things done and the skills you need for pretty much any job, right? How do I do my job? What works in this workplace? You know, what 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 do I have to be worried about? Yeah, those things seem like they're pretty essential, but I think particularly when you bring representation into the picture and you say, okay, you are here as my representative, that complicates it because for some people, they're not thinking about process as much as I yell about it, that it's like a major, major component of what holds us together. Um, they're thinking about someone who thinks like me. 
Uh, and that's, you know, a reason to put someone in office, but it doesn't help uh, anyone, you know, kind of know how to work the system. And we see that, right? You see that part particularly in semi-recent years, there are some members of Congress, and again, this is not new, some members of Congress where you're like, wow, that person doesn't really know how to do what they're doing or what they should or shouldn't do. Um, I remember like in the 1830s, there was a... I think a representative who um, his name was Sawyer uh, and he would bring in like this huge lunch and like sit at a desk and eat this huge lunch when Congress was in session and everybody would see it. And apparently he liked to eat sausages. So he became known in the press as Sausage Sawyer. <laughs> so I don't know, I'm having a huge feast. It was like protocol. Um, there were a lot of things going on in the antebellum Congress that now we would not consider protocol, but that in particular, Sausage Sawyer. Um, that was not considered normal. So, you know, the house is us. So some degree of, um, unpredictability is, is normal, I would say in part. All right. Um, Cece has a couple of questions. She says, okay, so state of the union, has it ever caused a massive controversy? Like, was there ever like a big controversy spurred from something that was said during a state of the union. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, so, so for all of the reasons that I started out talking about, um, it's, you know, a way of presenting a vision and, or it's a way of campaigning and, or it's a way of addressing the nation. Um, it, you could see how it wouldn't necessarily take a lot to cause a controversy. You know, I mean, I think, Last night's address didn't necessarily, you know, we could pick at things or point to things that he did or didn't say uh, and and talk about it, should, can talk about it. But there are, have been other cases in which, you know, something very controversial was said or done. And then you just know the next day uh, in a way that isn't just, let's talk about how this is bad for Biden or let's talk about his age again, but in a more informed kind of a way um, causes people to really argue about either the president, about what his party stands for or doesn't stand, stand for, about what the president is saying about the nation. There are any number of different ways in which there could be a big controversy. I just, and, and I'm saying right now that there doesn't seem to have been a lot that could cause a controversy, but that's silly of me because we are living here in this time. And I would bet, um, I haven't looked at newspapers. I'm looking at the time because I don't know, you would think by the end of the day, we're gonna get some, ah, sort of screaming about it, you know, I think you could validly say, what did he say about Gaza and Israel? Not a lot, right? Building a pier to get supplies into Gaza um, is, it feels, um, I don't know how thought out that is. Uh, and so you could say, he didn't offer much of an explanation. He didn't offer much about that. So you could, and you could make that a controversy um, because it's worth talking about, right? Um, so anyway, we'll see. We, I, I, silly me for getting the time that we live in. There will be a controversy um, and that might be it. I don't know, but um, I guess we'll have to see. I don't know. The last five or six years, I feel like we have at least six controversies before lunch. I know. <laughs> well, we do, right? Like, there's so many, I can't keep track of them all. It, it used oh. to be, you know, when I was trying to decide what to talk about on uh, history matters. Um, I would be like, hmm, you know, now it's more like, do I talk about this or this? I know, well, State of the Union, that seems obvious. But then I read something about Russia in the press. That's important. But I'll, anyway, we live in different times. Yeah, we might have to do this on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> with all the controversies. There. Okay, um, that'd be really hard for us to do with our travel schedule. Okay, so um, the last question in the queue is, why do Supreme Court justices attend the State of the Union? When did this tradition start? Or what is the reason behind having them all sitting there? Well, the same reason everybody else is sitting there, right? I mean, it's a moment where you're bringing the government together without, except for select people who are kept out of the room in case something horrible happens. Um, it is a moment bringing the government together. And, and you know, sometimes, well, like this time, I think, not all the Supreme Court justices were there, I believe. Um, but I think it's part of the 
same practice that brings, you know, members of the cabinet and um, it's more much more recent that you now we have people, you know, visitors that can be pointed to as part of the comments that are being made in the address. So I, I think that's partly a demonstration of branches of government coming together to address the State of the Union is, is part of that. Um, yeah, that's right. That Kay put it, executive, legislative and judicial. There was a comment up here I was going to... Um, Oh, Francesca mentioned, uh, and it's true, when Nancy Pelosi tore up Trump's speech, that was controversial um, and and interesting, right? So that indeed, uh, you know, she did it deliberately. She did it with some gusto. Um, she did it, you know, to get attention for doing it. And she did. And you're right that that um, got a reaction and, you know, obviously was partisan. Uh, so that was a moment, you know, that we still remember. I think I even wrote something about it because um, there was so much what I called pearl clutching. Oh, what did she do? She destroyed the state of the union address. You know, like she had committed, um, literally like done something illegal. Uh, I remember like, but she, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a presidential record. We need to take care of those. Huh. Um, but at any rate, um, it, it was something that got, created a big controversy bigger than probably it ought to because people were kind of talking about it as though it was a crime uh when it was just a very aggressive statement no we, we can't do history matters 24 7 guys there's not enough know, coffee right? in the world there's not enough coffee in the world um, okay dale just squeezed in a last minute question he asked right. would you like to comment on justice thomas's absence last night either now or in the after party um, I think Justice Alito. Yeah, Alito and, and, and Thomas were both absent, but they were, were one absent. of Thomas. It just seemed with all the controversy swirling around him in recent months. Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to comment on that. I'm just going to say um, Justice Thomas uh, is making lots of statements and things that he is doing and not doing. Uh, and so this is one of many, I would say. All right, we cleared the deck this week. Amazing. At exactly 11 o'clock, because you did start like eight minutes early. So we had a little extra time. That's right, that's true, oh, that's true. We got extra time. Okay, so folks, let me explain uh, what's going to happen now. Um, so uh, we are going to segue to the after party. Uh, and what that means is that we will no longer be recording what's going on here so that we can be even freer and easier in our conversation and talk about whatever the heck we want to talk about. Um, if you are beaming in through Facebook, you need to leave Facebook to be in the after party and you need to go to nchteach.org slash conversations. That's nchteach.org slash conversations. And then you, poof, I say that every week, uh, will be in the up. after party. If you are here right now, just stay right where you are and poof, you will be in the after party too. Um, I want to um, thank everybody for, as I say every week, and I mean it every week, engaging in the conversation of democracy, for coming here every week for 206 weeks to talk about politics, to talk about history, to talk about what things mean, to ask questions, to, to really try and get to the root of things. Um, to give each other a sense of what matters or doesn't matter to us in the moment and what that means uh, to create the community that we've created. All of this matters in the working of democracy. And so as ever, um, I thank all of you for being here uh, for this. I don't think I said, um, I'm going to say it now just to mess it up. I don't think I said, that's right, uh, Tim. I was like, I don't think I said contingency, which I say every week. And now I have said it. Uh, so that everybody can get bingo, but I do say that every week. Um, at any rate, uh, I do want to thank you all for being here, and I want, I want to thank Sam slash Claire and Annie and John and Jessica um, for being here and making this possible, uh, and I want to thank the community for being a wonderful community that you are. I want to wish everybody um, a wonderful week this coming week. Uh, Sam the Avocado. That's who Sam is. Uh, and I think with that, we can we can poof our way to the after party. Almost. Almost. <laughs>